Welcome, friends, to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. I'm Jennifer Innes, and it is my honor to serve with the ministry of this congregation. On this Labor Day weekend, may you have a moment to rest from your cares and troubles. May you refresh yourself for attending to your life. May this service be part of your renewal. Thank you for being with us. You are welcome. In attending to our lives, we recognize the lives who have gone before us. We remember the Peoria people who created their world and cherished the earth around us. I have one announcement before you hear a special note from Board President Linda Fairbanks. On Sunday, September 13th, is our kickoff for the start of the new church year. We will share an in-gathering and a water communion. Now, the water communion uh, takes a different form this year than trying to gather in person and pour water into a common vessel and share a little bit about uh, how we are refreshed and engaged for being part of the congregation again. In this moment, we cannot meet in person, so I want to invite you to take a photo, make a short video of you and whoever's in your house uh, in a moment where you are so gathered, pouring water, carrying water with you. You're also welcome uh, for today, September 6th, from 1 to 3 p.m. in the parking lot to do kind of a drive-through uh, sharing of the waters. And I'll be there with a vessel that you may kind of add your water to, the common vessel, and we'll take a photo or a short video then too. If you take something uh, at home and share it with us, I ask that you share it by no later than noon on Wednesday, September 9th. And I invite you to come to our service next Sunday and be part of the in-gathering that you help create along with us. And now we have a message from Linda Fairbanks. Today, Reverend Jennifer is leading a question and answer type of service. So I thought I would pose a question. How many times have we seen video of a black man being beaten or shot by police? It's likely that you don't have a number off the top of your head because it has happened so many times. Now think about the time before cell phones. How many times has it happened and we didn't see it or hear it or believe it if it was reported? Now think about 400 years of not seeing, not believing the brutality and oppression of black people. It's clear that black lives have not mattered and that is the basis for the Black Lives Matter movement. In our August 26th board meeting, we were on the subject of our racial justice project and board members came to the conclusion that it is past time for our church to have a Black Lives Matter sign in front to emphatically show our support. A motion was made to the board requesting approval of the sign and that motion was seconded and the vote was taken. A clear majority approved the motion. While the board vote was a strong yes, it was not unanimous. Some members and friends of our church have questions and reservations about posting such a sign. For that reason, the board asked the Racial Justice Project to host a forum about Black Lives Matter and to lead the design and placement of the sign. As the Racial Justice Project moves forward with plans, these forums are a chance for questions, discussion, listening, and learning. I am incredibly proud of this board for taking action and of the Racial Justice Project's progress. I ask that each of you participate in our racial justice efforts in any way that you can. Let us be the change we want to see in the world. Thank you, Linda. And now I invite you to enter into a time of worship. Robert French Levin reminds us holy and beautiful, the customs which bring us together in the presence of the Most High, to face our ideals, to remember our loved ones in absence, to give thanks, to make confession, 
to offer forgiveness, to be enlightened, and to be strengthened. Through this quiet hour breathes the worship of ages, the cathedral music of history. Three unseen guests attend, faith, hope, and love. Let all our hearts prepare them place. Let us give such guests a place as we gather in worship together. just be the year to do that. I'm guessing that many of you out there already have ideas in your heads that you would like to help happen in the next weeks and months. And to get you started and help you on your way, I thought I would tell you a story called What Do You Do With an Idea? by Kobe Yamada. I'll say about my idea. One day, I had an idea. Where did it come from? Why is it here? I wondered. What do you do with an idea? At first, I didn't think much of it. It seemed kind of strange and fragile. I didn't know what to do with it, so I just walked away from it. I acted like it didn't belong to me. But it followed me. I worried about what others would think. What would people say about my idea? I kept it to myself. I hid it away and didn't talk about it. I tried to act like everything was the same as it was before my idea showed up. But there was something magical about my idea. I had to admit, I felt better and happier when it was around. It wanted food. It wanted to play. Actually, it wanted a lot of attention. It grew bigger and we became friends. I showed it to other people even though I was afraid of what they would say. I was afraid that if people saw it, they would laugh at it. I was afraid they would think it was silly. And many of them did. They said it was no good. They said it was too weird. 
They said it was a waste of time and that it would never become anything. But then I realized, what do they really know? This is my idea, I thought. No one knows it like I do. And it's okay if it's different and weird and maybe a little crazy. I decided to protect it, to care for it. I fed it good food. I worked with it. I played with it. But most of all, I gave it my attention. My idea grew and grew, and so did my love for it. I built it a new house, one with an open roof where it could look up at the stars, a place where it could be safe to dream. I liked being with my idea. It made me feel more alive, like I could do anything it encouraged me to think big and then to think bigger. It shared its secrets with me. It showed me how to walk on my hands because, it said, it's good to have the ability to see things differently. I couldn't imagine my life without it. Then, one day, something amazing happened. My idea changed right before my very eyes. It spread its wings, took flight, and burst into the sky. I don't know how to describe it, but it went from being here to being everywhere. It wasn't just a part of me anymore. It was now a part of everything. And then, I realized what you do with an idea. You change the world. So I encourage you all as we move forward together, keep questioning how things are and keep thinking up ideas about how things could be. Then pay attention to those ideas. Believe in them. Act on them and we can change the world. So be it. In this, our time when we seek a connection with all that is our life, may we give place for the great questions in our lives, for our longings and our celebrations, for our sorrows and our joys, for the desperate cries of our heart. We give time and attention to the presence of this precious moment. May we listen deeply and reflect honestly. In our response, may we love when we offer a love without end. We offer some caring and supportive thoughts for Alexis Doak and her mother, who is hospitalized, for Joyce Rosenberger and her sister-in-law, Mary Sue Rosenberger, and brother Bruce, who live in Westerville, Ohio. Mary Sue is gravely ill. To Dick Crump, who is recovering at home following a hospital stay. To Mary Ka Kaffer Mulholland, who continues to heal physically, but has family issues causing concern. We send our congratulations to Lisa and Bert Robb as they celebrated their 17th wedding anniversary on August 27th. To Ginny Gunnar as she announces that after 50 years, it's a girl. Ginny, who has been mom to Tammy since she married Tammy's father, made their relationship legal with Tammy's adoption on August 29th. To Cinda Thompson and Keith Berry, as they prepared to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary on September 16th. Blessed are those who let their cries be heard. Blessed are those whose cares are silent among us. Let us bring into our circle of care those with cause for sorrow and cause for rejoicing. Blessed are those who let their joys be heard. Blessed are those with a quiet joy in their heart. Let us enter into a time of reflection and meditation. And I 
want to thank my colleague Jude Geiger for the meditation today. Spirit of life, God of many names, source of love. As summer slowly comes to a close and the air turns toward crisp, help us find a breath before the crush of the year of work and learning returns anew. Teach us to pace ourselves, to remember to find times of quiet and stillness, to appreciate one another, returning to the places that nourish our souls so that when we reach out, when we strive for family and home, we do so knowing who we are, with kindness and with care. In the life of our nation, we remember this Labor Day weekend, all the activists and organizers who help lift up our country to be its higher self through offering more fair work in both time and in safety. May we find new ways to build an economy that treats us all with equity and compassion. We especially hold in our hearts the people in Portland, Oregon, and Kenosha, Wisconsin, who in the face of murdering of more and more Americans by the state, have their protest met with tear gas and assault rifles and weaponized white youth. We hold in our hearts the people of Rochester, New York, as they learn about and protest the death of another black man, Daniel Prude, at the hands of the police. Mother of Grace, teach the nations new ways to respond to the needs of the most vulnerable with speed and diligence. And open our eyes to the daily sanctioned killings on our streets. May our hearts not be hardened to the plight of those far from our gaze. And we pray for our own nation, built upon the dreams and struggles of generations of immigrants and refugees. Find the spirit to renew our former pledge to all the tired and all the wretched in need, with a sense of humbleness especially. For we have forgotten where we came from, when we ignore another who is lost and far from home, or make excuses for yet another senseless killing. Let us take a moment to lift up all those who are in our hearts, all those who are before us in mind and reflection. I invite you to breathe with me, being attentive to the body and the breath and the feelings and the silence. Let us take a moment. We pray for the consciences of our elected officials and of our law enforcement, that they will be guided by love and a clear sense of justice. We pray for the safety and health of protesters everywhere as they risk injury and illness to demand justice for all and accountability for the powerful. And every day, we pray for the recovery of all those confronting the COVID-19 virus and for all the selfless healthcare workers beside them. We offer these prayers and all that are among us and within us and the spirit of love, in the work toward justice, and in the hope for peace. Let us offer these prayers. Amen. Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us imprisoned. Circle Circle for the planet, circle for each soul, for the children of our children, keep the circle whole. 
For the sermon this morning, it is a work in progress. Uh, this is something that we are going to create together. I have any number of questions from you, and I will answer them to the best of my ability in the time available, because this, this is the question box sermon. And any questions that I do not address will help inform worship for the coming year, and perhaps they will inform worship for the life of the congregation as a whole. Now, you may wonder, why is Reverend Jennifer looking to us for our questions? Doesn't she have plenty of things to talk about all on her own? And is this her way of getting out of writing a sermon? So I'll start with the second question, which is, well, yes, we've only just begun. And we've only just begun to explore the messages of our progressive religion in this time and place. We are just at the beginning. Now, to answer the third question, uh, does this get out of writing a sermon? Well, let me offer that to be here in this moment and answer the kinds of questions you may offer without any, hardly any time to think about them in no way lets me off the hook. And add to that, that I often do this in the context of worship in the moment, and need to remain in the moment of worship, whatever is asked of me. Believe me, this is both fun and serious business. Now, when in person, I take the questions during worship itself on that same day, I read them during the offering, and then arrange them on the pulpit, and we're off. In this moment, you all sent questions ahead of time. I will address them as best I can right now. And what I don't answer also helps me know what you are thinking in this time. Now, does, let me answer the first question. I'll say a little bit more about why Unitarian Universalist ministers ask for questions from the congregation. Our congregation choose who will preach and who will lead worship. Now, once chosen, the minister speaks the truth in love as they see it. And at the same time, part of the trust in the preaching minister is that we speak to the lives of the congregation and to the larger faith of which we are a part. Now, to do so without ever asking, what are your concerns? Well, what are your big questions? It keeps the minister, like myself, from a wonderful source of inspiration and information. Asking for your questions, I feel, is part of our covenant, part of the promises we make and keep in our service together. So let me begin in this moment and warm up with a few practical questions. Uh, let's see. First question, what is your favorite part of Peoria so far? And have you seen any of Peoria yet? This is a good question. 
but we have been getting out and about as a family. And I think our collective favorite part is when we're driving along Pioneer uh, and having a chance to kind of take in the vista uh, from the heights and looking out over uh, the Illinois River. I think that's probably, even it's, it's a little bitty glancing moment, but I think that's probably our favorite part as a family so far. We're also beginning to check out the playgrounds, and I have to say, the chance to hear the lions and other creatures in the zoo uh, is also a treat. Let's see. Have you and Patrick registered to vote in Peoria yet? We are working on that. Patrick confirmed that we're still having voting status uh, in our previous address in St. Charles, and we're about to go get everything changed over um, shortly. And we're looking, at, we're looking at how we might help with the election efforts and be volunteers in the course of this fall. And for a third kind of warm-up question, what do you miss about Texas? What do you miss about Texas? I think part of what we miss at this point are some of our neighbors. Uh, our children grew up there with their friends and buddies, and we still miss them. What I also miss about Texas, uh, we had such a variety and wonderful assortment of museums and good food from all across Dallas and Fort Worth. That is a treat that is unique to that area, and I definitely miss that as well. There's a spectacular vegan diner called Spiral Diner. They have the best vegan whipped cream. So now we've gotten a little warmed up. Let's see what the other questions hold. Now, one of the questions that comes up a lot in Unitarian Universalist conversations and often in the question box sermon is this one. How important is Christianity to a Universalist Unitarian Church. I'll say it again. How important is Christianity to Universalist Unitarian Church? Well, and this is in recognition of there's a large number of people in the congregation who have come from a difficult former uh, religious experience, particularly a, a religious experience that was Christian, uh, and that was hard and a concern for a lot of reasons. And we've also seen a lot of times, a great many times, when Christianity has been used to justify violence and bias uh, and harm and being exclusive um, and shame upon others. I mean, just it, it's stunning how, poor, how much uh, religion and Christianity in particular has been misused. But what is this role in Unitarian Universalism? Well, for one thing, it's one of our sources. And we do directly come from the Protestant tradition. Um, our worship very much resembles uh, what a lot of other congregations have around town, uh, with the hymns and the sermon and the message and so on. I think what we draw from in Christianity, it is one of our sources. Some of the teachings that we draw from, because the Unitarian Universalism really looks at the teachings of Jesus and rather than being about Jesus. And from those teachings, we see that Jesus acted up, that he threw over the tables in the temple when religion was being monetized, uh, when people were exploiting others uh, for their own benefit. I think we can take a lot of lessons from the teachings of Jesus and how he served and healed and was present to everybody and said, you must love your neighbor. You must love your neighbor. I think just those pieces alone are things that we need to hold on to and keep practicing in any context, and particularly in a context such as this, where we talk about the inherent worth, the free search, supporting each other's spiritual growth, and a deep sense of compassion and justice. So for those reasons alone, 
Christianity has a lot of presence in Unitarian Universalism. Let's see. I think one of the pieces that I want to speak to, uh, given that we just had some messages go out to the congregation uh, about Black Lives Matter, so I want to offer this piece. So some of the questions for this evening have asked about Black Lives Matter and how the congregation might show up. Uh, let's see. So let me offer. Given that the board has voted to have a Black Lives Matter banner displayed on church grounds, and that we have seen other Unitarian Universalist churches, Black Lives Matter uh, signs, do you worry about the increased attention our church might receive, whether negative or positive? Let me say again. Do you worry about the increased attention that our church might receive, whether negative or positive? So with regards to, uh, I think, Black Lives Matter, one of the pieces that I think is important is we're all going to still keep coming from a lot of different um, perspectives when thinking about how the protests are going and Black Lives Matter and what is this, how is this showing up in our society and how to respond to it in this moment, particularly with so much heartbreak and violence uh, happening along with peaceful protests. So, the, in my experience, um, I was with the congregation I was with in Fort Worth, First Jefferson. Um, the members there responded to the shootings at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, um, by coming to the board a few members came to the board uh, just a week or so after that shooting and said, we need to show up and we need to show up with a Black Lives Matter sign now. And the board heard them and said, yes, we do. And they put one up. Um, and it was defaced like within weeks. But the people painted it to fix it and it stayed. And it does draw attention to the congregation. And within the congregation, we had a lot of different conversations about um, what does this mean? Why, are we have, why do we have this public statement? And what about the other perspectives? You know, members of the congregation whose family were in service in the police, what did that mean to them that the church was saying this? Um, I think what we also realized and what I preached with them a number of times was kind of further unpacking that conversation as we went and realizing how much a part of the mission that sign became uh, in the life of the congregation. And that was a constant witness, not just for the people on the street who would pass by or for the neighbors, but for the congregation itself. It's such a significant reminder of our deepest values um, that that we recognize, I mean, the core of Black Lives Matter is saying that for the past 400 years, people of color, black people in particular, have not been treated as if they matter. And now we need to make a change. And we all need to show up to make that happen because it's so systemically integrated into our systems. Now, do I have a concern for the congregation? In this moment, I think in this time, we've had a, a lot of deepening of the understanding of what does Black Lives Matter mean as a society, and I know this congregation's done some work and reflection on its own. In this moment, I tell you the spirit of the board was an enthusiastic, by and large an enthusiastic, this is the time. We need to be showing up now. And I think there is something to be said to re-responding to that spirit. And I want to offer that there's going to be some opportunities for conversation to kind of further talk about what does this mean? Help me understand Black Lives Matter more. How do we show up? What does this mean for our church? We're going to have a few conversations about that too. I think it can garner some negative attention, but I think it also, more importantly, manifests, makes practical and real what this congregation also says is important 
that you really want to show up for and is kind of in many ways fulfilling a lot of the justice and advocacy work that you all have been doing for years. This makes that specific and real and tangible and visible in a whole new way. And that is brave and that is wonderful. And I'm sure we'll talk about it more. So what I want to offer in this moment, um, I want to encourage in this moment partially our kind of looking at how do we participate in the larger conversations uh, that are in our world. I want to applaud the members who are working so diligently to be present for voting, uh, to be advocating for the post office, uh, for showing up and encouraging um, the fair tax uh, vote uh, in this fall as well, to keep putting before us what are our values to make sure that people are treated fairly, that are part of an economy where they can have a chance. I also want to offer a note of sorrow uh, for the community garden that was raised, um, that was flattened uh, the other day, um, that so many members of the congregation I saw on Facebook and in person uh, in our conversations the last day or so were saying, this was a labor of love. This was so important. Um, the Renaissance Community Garden, I believe it's called. This was so important and fed people and was a place of gathering and a place of music, and it's such a loss. In this moment, if this, any ways that this congregation can keep showing up and keep being present, that is a way that we can demonstrate our spirit and our faith. What I want to close with and I have a lot more questions, but I'll be keeping those and we'll be answering those a lot of way along the way. What I want to close with is a couple of questions from our president, Linda Fairbanks. And she asks, do you have days when you wish you had gone into another profession? Following on, these must be amongst the most challenging days of your career. What keeps you going? So the first question, do you have days when you wish you had gone into another profession? No, not for quite some time. Every now and then I try to reimagine, try to imagine what another profession would look like. And what I so appreciate, in, there's so many things that I appreciate about ministry, which is being present for people in all the ways we can be, that we don't I don't get to be, I don't have to be alone in the work of observing and reflecting and taking in the, the struggle of the world, that we get to do this together. What I also love is that on any given day in ministry, I have no idea what I'm going to encounter. A lot of days have a lot of the same kinds of things show up, but you know what? There's also these days when I could be you know, one of my first days of my ministry as an intern in Maine, I'm trying to write the sermon and the property owner comes by because the church had just started to rent a building for the first time in a new congregation. The property owner comes by and she and I end up kind of under the crawl space looking at the plumbing. So that ministry can be presence and preaching and plumbing all in the same day, I think I have a pretty good deal. Now, what keeps you going? I think, in short, I take the long view. I'm on the 50-year plan in terms of ministry, and I'm at year 20 plus. There is so much more to do, and there's so many people to serve with together. For this year, I'm trying to focus on what's the most important things that we can do together, and that's worship and pastoral care and enriching and how do we maintain our connections along with the good work and important work of racial justice. So my three words for this year are covenant, quality, and connection. I think if we can focus on those, 
we will go a long way together. So covenant, quality, and connection. My goal, and I've said this in a couple of places, my goal is I want to be present and see all of you when we, when a year from now when we can gather together, however we might gather. Whatever we can do to make sure that we all get to next year together, that's our task. And we can do this if we focus on covenant, quality, and connection. So those are some of the things that help me keep going in any moment and in every moment. And now, thank you for your questions. Your questions make this possible and make the quality of experience and the conversations we will have together. We, this is where we create ministry. Not me and not just you, but all of us. And we're all the stronger and the better for it. Amen.
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our time for questions has ended, and still our search has only just begun. May we go forth from this moment in the spirit of wonder, knowing that as we bring the light of truth out into the world, we too will always need space for more light to enter. Let us rejoice that we may make that space in a community such as this, in a company with the ever-present mystery of life. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. And please join us for coffee hour after worship. The Zoom link will be visible during the postlude.